Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm thrilled to welcome everyone to Pathways to Justice, Sanctuary's Incarcerated Gender Violence Survivors Initiative. Um, I'm George and Lightholt, and I direct Sanctuary's Legal Center. As many of you know, Sanctuary works to address the urgent multifaceted needs of gender violence survivors. Our network of emergency and transitional residences shelter 200 survivors and their children every single night. Our clinical department provides trauma-informed counseling, individual and group and case management to both adult and child survivors. The Legal Center helps adult and child survivors pursue protection and relief under a wide array of legal remedies across practice areas. Through public policy and legislative advocacy, we strive to improve the response of the systems our clients access or become ensnared in. You may have heard of our Courtroom Advocates Project, our Immigration Intervention Project, our Economic Justice Project, and our Anti-Trafficking Initiative, each addressing a crucial set of survivors' legal needs. The Incarcerated Gender Violence Survivors Initiative is our most recent legal project, but the needs it addresses are not new. One of the priorities of our movement in its early days was the urgent plight of survivors facing criminalization and enduring incarceration. The hard work of our predecessors led to important advances such as the development of the battered woman syndrome, which gave survivors who killed intimate partners, abusive intimate partners, a viable defense. There were even some mass grants of clemency, but the advances stopped and the toll grew. Record numbers of gender violence survivors are serving prison sentences, often disproportionately lengthy because of the gender violence they were subjected to and survived. The Incarcerated Gender Violence Survivors Initiative represents Sanctuary's work to rectify and remedy this human rights crisis. Our panelists today are Nefertiti Alexander, a partner at Kazowitz, Benson and Torres, Jerry Fang, um, an associate at Simpson, Thatcher and Bartlett, Shanice Hinkson, also an associate at Simpson, Thatcher, Dennis McInerney, um, counsel to Davis Polk and Ward Well and the board president of Sanctuary for Families, Dr. Chitra Raghavan, clinical psychologist, professor of psychology um, at John Jay, College of Criminal Justice and Director of John Jay's Forensic Mental Health Counseling Program. Richard Rothman, Special Pro Bono Counsel at Weill, Gottschall and Mangies, and co-chair with me of the Incarcerated Gender Violence Survivors Initiative. Um, and Benta Watkins, Staff Attorney at Kazowitz, Benson and Torres. It's my immense pleasure to introduce you to Ross Kramer, who directs our Incarcerated Gender Violence Survivor Initiative. Um, Ross will moderate this discussion. Thanks, Dorjan. Um, and thank you to everyone for being here. Uh, we're very grateful for the opportunity to tell you about the initiative, uh, IGBSI, um, and the really important work that we're doing. Uh, we work with survivors of domestic violence, gender-based violence, uh, intimate partner violence, who are caught up in the criminal justice system. Uh, this includes survivors who are already sentenced, survivors who are facing incarceration, uh, being investigated for a crime or having been charged with a crime, and even victim witnesses. Uh, along with our pro bono partners, we're working with really highly traumatized survivors who need the best advocates, which means not only the best lawyers, but trauma-informed lawyers who can provide the support and, and holistic care that our clients need. Um, we're currently keeping a roster of about 20 cases. And on those cases, we work with dozens of different pro bono attorneys. Uh, I've had the chance and the privilege to work with some of the best lawyers in New York on our cases, both young attorneys and more experienced attorneys. And you'll meet some of them today. This is very, very difficult, very intense work that we're doing. 
but honestly, it's also some of the most rewarding work that I've done in my career. Um, so, you know, thank you all again for being here and I hope we have a chance to work together in the future. Uh, one of our hosts is gonna put my email address and phone number in the chat. And if you wanna be involved in this work or you just wanna talk about it on the phone or over a coffee sometime, please reach out to me anytime and, and I'd be really happy to do that. Uh, lastly, one logistic point. Uh, if you have questions, please feel free to put them in the chat box. I will do my best to monitor the chat as we go along, and I will um, try to uh, put those questions to our panelists. Uh, if we don't get a chance during um, the presentation, I will try to answer your questions uh, by email and get back to you. Um, and thank you again. Um, so to start off the panel, we have Rich Rothman, who is one of the co-founders of the initiative. Um, back in 2016, 2017. Rich, when you started the initiative, you, you, you know, when you came up with this idea with DoorChain and put it into practice, what were you envisioning and what were you hoping to achieve? What, what were your initial goals? Thanks, Ross. Well, the origin of the initiative dates back, as you just mentioned, to 2017 when uh, Dorchen and I represented Nikki Rosakis, uh, a woman who had been a victim of horrific uh, domestic violence and who killed her husband after a call to 911 yielded no help and he had threatened to kill her. Uh, Nikki served over 23 years in prison and was denied parole three times. Uh, we started as a typical Dorchin exercise. Dorchin reached out to Nikki and volunteered uh, our services. Uh, neither Dorchin nor I had ever done a parole case. And we learned as we went, we asked a lot of questions and, and, uh, and worked our way through it. Uh, and Nikki was granted parole. Uh, but in the process, we gained an understanding of how difficult it was for women going through the parole process. Many, if not most of them suffering from trauma, they had no right to counsel. The parole hearings were conducted by video and they usually had only five to 10 minutes to answer what were often hostile questions. Uh, and commissioners were not given the material, written material until the morning of the hearing. So we realized that the deck was really stacked against these traumatized women who were often re-traumatized as a result of this really deficient process. And so we, we thought about how valuable it would be if other victims, uh, incarcerated victims of domestic violence could have good lawyers to represent them and help them through the process. And so we decided to form the initiative. And we started with four law firms. And we had three basic goals, to recruit and help train pro bono lawyers who would take these cases on, to educate uh, the public and uh, the parole commissioners among others, uh, and to play an ad advocacy role. And as we went ahead and did this work, we realized that it was also important critically important to have top-notch forensic psychologists, social workers on the team who could help us prepare our clients. But most importantly, through reports provided to the parole board to explain the trauma that so many victims suffered and that so many parole commissioners didn't understand or appreciate. And to explain the crimes uh, committed often by women who had never committed crimes before. A particularly difficult task when the crimes were not committed against the abuser, as we've seen. And as we moved ahead, we realized the importance of including survivors in our effort to help us better understand the issues. And from there, we grew in both number and scope. Uh, we took on clemency work, and then more recently, uh, cases under the Domestic Violence Survivors Justice Act that you'll hear about later this morning and which has become a major part of our work. And so 
in the process, we've grown to include about 15 law firms, legal services organizations, survivors, psychologists, social workers, and activists, and about 60 members. And the benefits have been clear. Uh, we have had a pretty almost a perfect record in helping clients seeking parole, clemency, and now relief under the DVFJA. And we've been able to achieve those results as a result of the great work of the team members and the way they've worked together. So it's been five years, pretty hard to believe uh, how far we've come with such a wonderful group working together for such truly deserving clients. And uh, Rich, we have, we actually, one of the, one of the things we do with the initiative is to have uh, regular meetings where we bring um, all of our members together by Zoom or in person and um, try to have some presentations. Um, is there anything, um, I guess that, I guess that covers our, our, um, what we're trying to do. Um, you know, you, you've, you've had so many cases, you know, do you, do you have something in mind as you know one of the most satisfying experiences that you've had working with IGVSI over these last five years? Well, yes, uh, Ross. You know what I would say is, having spent the bulk of my career litigating cases involving hundreds of millions and often billions of dollars, there is nothing so satisfying as helping a deserving victim of domestic violence, gender violence, gain uh, her freedom, uh, which is so richly deserved. Every time we've taken on one of these cases and they've involved crimes, which when you look at them on the surface, not knowing, not knowing the, the, uh, the person who was convicted seem inexplicable as we've learned about what they've been through, what they've suffered, how their needs were completely unmet by the system, the failings of the, of the criminal justice. As we've helped each of those women gain freedom, whether I'm working on the case or whether one of our other partner law firms is doing it, there's nothing more satisfying than that for a lawyer. Thanks so much, Rich. Um, Dr. Raghavan, um, Maybe we could turn to you for a minute. You've worked on quite a number of initiative cases with us. Um, and many of those cases have, the, have attorneys, initiative attorneys, pro bono attorneys, getting their first experience representing survivors. What, what advice do you give them? What, what makes survivors unique as a, as a client, um, as a group of clients? What makes representing them unique? Um, could, you, could you tell us a little bit about that, Dr. Raghavan? Absolutely. Um, and, and so I think what makes survivors unique is there's a tension um, between the person working with the, with the survivor being an unbiased fact checker, so to speak, and an advocate. So when, when there is trauma from abuse and violence, um, self-disclosure starts to be constricted. And self-disclosure starts when you feel you're being believed. But in order to feel they're being believed, you have to, the, the survivor has to feel like this person's an advocate. And that sometimes poses a problem because particularly forensic evaluators, but to some extent lawyers too should fact check. And so, and, and so the particular challenge, and I'm gonna sort of go into ways in which we can address that is, to begin with, um, survivors are used to being disbelieved. They're used to being dismissed. They used to they're used to being seen as liars, um, and they've often been hurt for telling the truth long before the criminal proceedings started. So it's a challenge because survivors don't want to talk about what happened, um, and at the same time, they won't talk about what happened unless they feel believed. Right. So how do you strike this balance? Um, I'm going to talk about sort of two large areas of importance that impact on how you gather facts to support this kind of case um, from a psychological perspective. And, and the first sort of important thing to note at a high level, and this for me is the easiest challenge, 
is the structure of how survivors give their narratives is rarely chronological. Um, this is often seen as a sign of unreliability or not cooperating or low intelligence or poor education, um, but it's often just, just the relevance of the trauma to the person speaking. And again, to me, this is the easiest challenge. You have to let go of your training, let go of your ego, your need for structure, and let it flow. And then come back and fill in the gaps. Um, colleagues tell me, um, both lawyers and young psychologists, that not redirecting makes them feel very anxious. But you really have to just let it go. And so what this means is multiple sessions. And then come back and figure out what's actually important to your case. And, and how to fill that in. That's one way, by the way, of increasing rapport without being, um, sometimes you can aggressively be an advocate. I can't, I'm an unbiased evaluator, and sometimes you can. And so, but that just letting survivors tell their stories and then coming back for what's important is one way of being present and sympathetic. Um, and that for me is the easier challenge. The bigger challenge, since a challenge all the way from the start of the case to the trial is missing information um, and in all of the cases i've worked in there's often missing information that is later deemed as crucial to the case um, now for example that I've, i'm on a case right now where the da is insisting that the client is lying about violent sexual abuse because she didn't disclose it to them at the time and well so the question then you should ask yourself as young lawyers coming in is why is there missing information? And here's where it gets really interesting and tricky. Often there's missing information because they weren't asked or they were not asked in a way that they could relate to. So a very simple example is there's a great study that asks a bunch of women, were you ever stalked? And all, almost all the women say no. And then the same people go back and ask, were you ever pursued in a way that made you uncomfortable and you told the person, I don't like this. Did he continue to send you letters? Did he continue to call you? And something like 70% answer yes. In other words, they were legally stalked. But if they're labeled as were you stalked, their answer is no, right? So this is often what happens with clients. They're asked, were you abused? And their answer is, well, no, I wasn't abused. I got into a fight where these things happened, but that's not abuse. So it might, you know, and that's the simple scenario where they were asked in a way that they didn't relate to and they didn't give you the answer. The more complex scenario is um, when, there's information that's not available because women might self-censor um, or self-conceal. They're, they're two different things really, but I'm, I'm gonna use them roughly as the same thing. Women might self-censor or survivors might self-censor if they think something is unimportant or irrelevant. Um, and it, and this has happened to me in almost every case, um, including cases where the thing that they chose to self-censor was the thing that later on the case would hinge on. For example, um, concealing, censoring a lengthy period of being sex trafficked at an earlier point in her life, later on she's in prison for something else. But that in fact influenced her actions. Um, women might self-censor because they're ashamed. Um, women might self-censor. And each of these things requires very different tactics um, because they blame themselves and therefore feel it shouldn't be brought up um, because they don't think they'll be believed because the story is so fantastic, because they're protecting someone. And these are all sort of these five things, and I'll repeat them, um, because they think it's unimportant, because they're ashamed, they blame themselves, they don't think they're be believed, or they're protecting someone, sort of fall into the motivation categories of why they're self-centering or self-concealing and requires probing. Women might also not give this information because they don't remember. The don't remember category is much trickier. And survivors might not remember because there's no memory of it. That frequently happens when you're in a very, very violent or frightening situation, that memory may not have been internalized. It doesn't exist. That memory doesn't exist. Um, or they don't remember it because they repressed it. This is a dangerous route to go, but it shows up now and then. Or they don't remember it because they just haven't thought about it, and that's from disuse. And they eventually do remember it and will bring it up. But all of these reasons 
are often seen as malingering, as lying, you know, like, why didn't they bring it up? And so part of the challenge of, you know, a lot of the DVSJ cases are really about missing information. And so it's about getting this information at the level that you need for litigation, and but also the reason for which it's missing ends up being very important to the prosecutors and the judges. Um, and so the crucial thing here is really to mark these experiences, note them, note the reasons why you didn't have this data, and and then ask yourself, to what extent do you truly believe that this is not malingering, that they're not lying, that you have the reasons for, you know, and explore all the avenues till you get to a case that you think is representing the narrative. So um, I'll stop there, but that's that's my sort of, I guess, advice. Dr. Ogman, um, I have found, and I think a lot of our panelists today have found that one of the big challenges in representing survivors that, that's a little different than any other area of law is, is the difficulty sometimes in building the trust between attorneys and clients, or I'm sure between therapists and clients, counselors and clients. What do you see as the best things? What, what do the best attorneys do? What do the best attorneys avoid to build that relationship of trust so that they can get those facts from a client? I'm going to give you a terrible answer. Um, and so clients, clients feel comfortable with attorneys who believe them. And clients are so used to being ill-treated, they know when you're being polite versus when you're being believed. Um, one of the first things clients tell me repeatedly is my defense lawyer didn't believe me. And they're still angry about it 20 years, as they should be angry about it 20 years later. So it sort of goes back to the first thing I said, how, you know, you could, you could choose to start as an advocate and don't be afraid of it as someone, you know, that you're going to take this client and that you're going to, if not believe every word she says, believe her suffering. Um, you're, going to, you're going to believe that this woman or man, but typically woman has been treated poorly, and you're going to believe that she's suffering. And so I think you have to do a little work internally to, to when you, this is not something you can play, you can perform. One of the things trauma does is it opens you up and clients will sense if you're lying or performing or acting, being polite, being nervous immediately, right? That's what trauma does, it, op it makes you hypervigilant. So I would say, and this is a terrible answer, um, try to be authentic with yourself and ask yourself, are you ready? Do you wanna do this? Where are you coming from? What are your biases? Is this because you wanna be a better lawyer for large cases? Is it because you're pissed off your grandmother didn't get the help she needed? Um, you know, know why you're doing it and then work with what you're uncomfortable with. And I know some law firms, you don't have this luxury, so you might have to do it with your best friend or your lover, but, but come into that space knowing where you stand with yourself. Uh, Dr. Ragman, just one last question. One thing that, that is so important right now is the, the ever-evolving understanding of, of trauma and getting that across to everyone. Two, two concepts come up in our cases all the time, and I think people might mention them today. I was hoping you can give a very short uh, answer to this. <laughs> Traumatic bonding and coercive control. Those are things that, that uh, are so important to our cases right now to Ad, for advocates and lawyers to understand. Can you, can you give us a little bit about what those things are? Cursive control is a label or a framework that tries to explain how power imbalance is created and maintained. So how do abusers manipulate, exploit, abuse, blackmail? How did, how did they get the survivor to the place where they could control her and so and we look at a white and it's very nuanced so you can look at things like using blackmail for taking porn videos for example and if um and that's what it is it's it's a more sophisticated way of describing partner violence and we use it also for sex trafficking um trauma bonding is um is the older and, and broader and less accurate term for the Stockholm Syndrome. The way to think about it is when you're abused and you have traumatic outcomes, you can have a range of traumatic outcomes. One of them that feels very counterintuitive is to feel more dependent, more in love and with your abuser and feel that you cannot live without your abuser, that you owe your abuser, that you need to protect your abuser. This is not a, a sign of weakness, B, it is not an irrational love. It's not a love at all. What it really is, is a form of trauma. 
which oh. which manifests along the lines of a relationship just as depression manifests along emotion and ptsd manifests along cognitive um, break with emotions trauma bonding manifests along a relationship thank you so much and you know even as i do this work i'm learning new things all the time from talking to you other experts that we work with lawyers and and survivors themselves so this is always a learning process as i go through it um Dennis, I wanted to ask you a question um, before we turn to the actual case experiences that some lawyers have had through the initiative. You, you, you've seen the benefits of, of the IGVSI and the initiative firsthand because I've asked you on many occasions to help mentor other firms who are going through some of these cases, other lawyers, and you've been able to develop a lot of strategies for, for representing survivors. As someone who's seen the initiative grow from the beginning to what it is now, what have you seen? What, what are some of the ways the initiative has, has grown and expanded? And what are some of the ways that it offers real value to the, to the members? Yeah, I mean, I, I've just been so impressed with what the initiative is able to do and how it's evolved over the last several years. Yeah, I think the initiative offers value, not just to its members, uh, but to the broader community on, on several levels. Uh, the first is through education, um, uh, through its bi-monthly meetings uh, with practitioners, uh, but also uh, through its various uh, programs that are open not just to uh, practitioners, but to the broader community, like what we're doing today. Uh, the initiative is shining a bright and informed light uh, on a wide spectrum of issues that just have not received adequate attention in the past. Uh, and in that regard, uh, I think of issue spotting as being probably the second uh, important role that the initiative serves. Um, whether it's hearing uh, what folks are doing in a case and, and realizing, as you were just alluding to, that uh, there may be another way to address the challenge uh, or, or seeing where the law uh, or the process for implementing the law is, is inadequate in some respect uh, or where there are some other unmet needs. Uh, the initiative is identifying those issues and then uh, figuring out a way to, to help to address them. And then, so that brings me to, you know, how does the initiative do that? Uh, and it basically do, does that through uh, two ways. One is uh, making connections with the right folks. And the other is through advocating. Uh, in terms of uh, making connections, they do this in so many different ways, uh, including connecting clients to lawyers, uh, lawyers to experts uh, like uh, Dr. Raghavan uh, and lawyers to lawyers. And so, as you alluded to Ross, for example, you're regularly reaching out to, to us, to other law firms I know, uh, to say that you've heard about a case in which XYZ is happening and you either know that we may have some experience with that issue or you, you wanna know if we'd ha had any experience with that issue. And if so, he then sets up a meeting Everyone gets on the call. We all talk through things and see if we can be of any assistance. And often we wind up establishing kind of a regular dialogue. Um, but beyond the specific case connections, uh, it's really been inspiring to see how Ross and Rich and Dorchin are constantly mulling over issues uh, that they're seeing and asking who is out there who is an expert on that or, or who could be a good advocate to speak to that issue. Uh, and so in terms of advocating, uh, after identifying an issue uh, that needs the attention of others, uh, the initiative often takes a leadership role in the outreach and then the presentations to whom, whomever the audience is, uh, whether it's how a statute can be improved, uh, how prison conditions can be reformed, uh, or how uh, to persuade law enforcement and the judicial community about the, the merits of adopting certain approaches to, to whatever the issue is. So in short, uh, the initiative is an extraordinarily helpful and uh, multifaceted vehicle for this historically underserved community. Thanks so much, Dennis. Um, now we're gonna um, talk about, you know, the real heart of the initiative, which is working on cases, working with survivors to uh, decarcerate the system, to give them a, a second opportunity at, at freedom to reconnect with family and, and, and friends. And uh, 
one of the areas that we've had tremendous success recently is in parole preparation work, um, helping a survivor prepare for upcoming parole hearings. And one terrific success story was um, Binta and Nefertiti, uh, who also uh, who, who took on one of these cases that was very, very difficult and got a fantastic result. Um, Binta, so you, rep you represented one of our survivors in a parole case. Um, can you tell us a little bit about, about her first and how she ended up where she was needing the assistance and, and, and the case that you took on? Sure, Ross. Um, so first I wanted to start off by saying that our client was granted parole and she is scheduled to be released in March. So we're very excited about that. Um, Nefertiti and myself and another colleague of ours, Teresa, Ma Teresa Manajay, were on the case. Um, our client was about approximately four years ago, our client used another person's identity and opened up a credit card and then used that card to purchase items. She ended up being sentenced to three to seven years for identity theft, larceny, um, also along with an unrelated bail jumping charge. And our client had a very traumatic and difficult childhood. First, she was a victim of sexual assault by her mother's domestic partner. She had hinted at the abuse to her mother. However, her efforts were unsuccessful. She ultimately confided in school officials and uh, along with law enforcement, they were able to help her end the abuse. And um, you know, she was very brave and ended up testifying in open court against her abuser. And that led to his conviction. Unfortunately, that wasn't the only instance where our client suffered um, sexual abuse and violence. Um, as a high schooler, she was taken advantage of by a much older man who sexually abused and controlled her. She attempted to escape that violent situation multiple times. She tried to go to family. However, he convinced her family that she should return with him. And um, so she did. Uh, on another occasion, he held a gun to her head and when she tried to leave, and so she felt she couldn't leave, of course. Um, and the final incident was a violent alter altercation that ended up unfortunately resulting in her having a miscarriage. Ultimately, that abuser was convicted and she was out of that relationship. Um, in addition to the abuse, our client also um, grew up in an economically depressed neighborhood where there was a lot of crime. She witnessed her mother stealing items like uh, such as toys, clothing, and products to help the, you know, get money to help the family survive. Um, also, eventually, both her parents were deported and she was left to care for her siblings. Um, one of the things that was important for us to consider when we were preparing our client for her parole hearing was how the trauma that she suffered and her upbringing impacted the choice impacted the choices that she ended up making in her life. And in talking to her, we learned that she felt that stealing was her best option to help provide for her siblings when her parents were deported. We also learned that, you know, at times she could be a bit defensive and that was more to protect herself from being hurt and taken advantage of again. So we had to sort of understand where she was coming from to understand how to help her move forward. Um, so some of the things that we did to prep for our hearing uh, were that we had a series of in-person info gathering sessions so we could understand what our client's goals were and what her family support system was. And during these sessions, you know, we tried to make her as comfortable as possible. Um, and as, um, you know, Dr. Um, Raghavan mentioned, you know, it's very important to try and connect with your client because we wanted to get what her, her story was so that we could share that story with the parole board so they could understand where she was coming from. And so we, you know, needed to build rapport and we had to do that relatively quickly because we had such a short time between when we got the case and when our client would ultimately go before the parole board. Um, so we had to do a lot of active listening. We had to, you know, be genuine. We had to be empathetic to her. Sometimes, you know, we had to share stories about ourselves. So we had to open up so that she would open up to us. And, you know, we had to do simple things like we had to care for her, you know, make sure she had lunch while we were there. We just had to develop this sort of relationship with her so that she could trust us, so that she could tell us her story, so that we could then relay that story to the parole board. Um, the other thing we needed to understand was how to 
figure out what gaps that our client had and to provide her with the resources that she needed to fill those gaps. And this was our client's second hearing before the parole board. And in talking to her, we realized how unprepared she was the first time around. And she didn't know what she needed for the parole board. She had heard, you know, from other inmates that she would have to do certain things. But, you know, she walked in there and she just had no idea what she was doing. And ultimately, she wasn't granted parole that time. Um, so we did things like, you know, have advice giving sessions uh, for her where we tried to get her to understand what the parole board was looking for. Um, one of the things that our client had an issue with is that she had what were called, what they called tickets. And it's basically their write-ups for disciplinary infractions. And our client's tickets, they weren't particularly serious. Um, one thing that comes to mind is she got in trouble because she was in an area of the prison that she shouldn't be in. Um, and the, in, in speaking about the tickets, um, there was also, uh, we, we, this is where we focus some of our trauma work on. Um, as I mentioned before, our client could somewhat be somewhat defensive. And this was because of her life experiences. So Nefertiti was instrumental in, in this part where she provided our client with materials to help her work through some of the frustration that she had with guards and other inmates that would get her these tickets that would then be on her record and then the parole board would look unfavorably at. Um, we also helped her draft her parole packet and that involved telling the parole board her story, uh, letting them know what her plans were for the future to prevent her from you know, reoffending. Um, she had to get letters from her family. She did a great job, you know, following up with her family, making sure that they provided those things for her. Um, and she was just instrumental in getting everything together in order to make sure that she had a fulsome parole packet. Um, we also did mock um, prep sessions um, and we did a lot of visits and calls closer to the date just to sort of, you know, make her feel comfortable, make her feel prepared. Um, I think one thing, to consider in, in doing this work is also certain issues we had, um, I think in hindsight, and the next time we do this, we'd probably request her, her, her um, criminal record a little bit earlier because, you know, it's, it, it takes a long time to get these. So we didn't have that, but luckily we felt prepared with what we did have and everything worked out well. Um, also, it's very hard to speak to prison personnel, so um, we did a lot of calling, we did a lot of pestering in order to get someone on the phone to find out, you know, what did she need to, to, to provide to the parole board, did she have everything that she needed, was there anything else that we needed to do, um, and um, I think I'll let Nefertiti tell you the story of how we obtained her her compass report and the compass report is basically it's an assessment tool that the parole board will use to determine you know uh, whether uh, uh, the 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 uh, parolee or, or the person who's up for parole is likely to um, you know reoffend. Um, but I think overall it was just a great experience for us. Um, we're very happy that we were able to get her parole, and we're excited for her to continue to to move on to the next chapter of her life. Kinta, it, it sounds uh, from listening to you like you have a master's degree in trauma-informed lawyering at this point, but this, this was the first case that I was able to work with you on through the initiative. Was this the first case that you've, you've worked directly with a, a survivor? Yes. Uh, well, uh, yes, this is the first case I've worked wow. with a survivor. Yes. So it was amazing. It was great. So you are, you are our true advertisement for associates <laughs> getting involved in cases and, uh, and learning this because at this point... I couldn't be more grateful to have you take on more cases and you re you reached out to us right away to take on more. So we're working on that. Um, Nefertiti, I know you worked on this case too. Um, what what made your representation so successful? What 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 were the biggest challenges and, and how did you overcome them? So I think one of the most difficult parts of doing a case like this is that your client is still in a traumatic situation. Um, we are dealing with past trauma at the same time. Every single time we meet with her, we hear about very abusive situations with guards. She's seeing violent situations. 
um, that are unfair between guards and inmates, between um, groups of inmates and people that she knows. And so it's this constant process of trying to, you know, understand her current situation and sort of helping her um, draw on her internal resources to be able to sort of stand, uh, you know, above the fray. And um, I think, you know, Binta sort of, you know, explained the sort of in-depth process that we went through with her. Um, you know, we all came from our different vantage points to find a way to connect with her and, and offer, you know, what we could. Um, for me personally, I also understand some of the trauma of growing up in an underserved community. And that's something that I could really relate to our client about um, and understand that, you know, some of the patterns that she saw and some of the, you know, habits and the, the people that she interacted with, you know, helping her work through the process of being able to draw boundaries. Um, I think one thing that was sort of fortunate for us is that, you know, in terms of helping her, we did have the benefit of the trans um, decision from the parole hearing. And we were able to drill down on, on what we thought the parole board wanted to see and to also be able to uh, get a glimpse of what her um, condition was and behavior was at the hearing. And we could see sort of what questions um, pulled on her heartstrings that sort of, you know, led to a breakdown essentially during the parole hearing. Um, you know, having to go in front of strangers to try to explain the abuse that you've suffered without any sort of trauma work, um, you know, was evident from the transcript. And, and the parole board was very clear in saying that, you know, they, they wanted her to be able to be ticket free. They wanted her to be successful. And we had to work with this tension of, you know, someone, part of your story being that what you were convicted of is something that you saw repeatedly and that you thought was sort of, you know, became sort of ingrained in the way you conducted yourself and to be able to say, I'm going to change and I know that I can do something different. And so the challenge for us was sort of really helping her tap into all of those resources that she used to be able to, you know, pretend to be someone else in a store and remember her lines and, um, you know, plan, you know, what she was uh, going to do, which store she was going to go to and things of that nature and, and seeing her apply that to her reentry plans, right? Um, the parole board wanted to know if you're not going to be able to live this kind of lifestyle and who are you going to be around? Who's going to be your support system and what are you going to do? Um, and we were able to be on that journey with her in terms of planning out what her next steps, you know, were going to be. Um, but I think, you know, like I said, some of the challenge was that she was still in this very traumatic situation. You know, one of the first things that we did um, was to give her some reference materials so that we could have conversations with her about what she was reading. Um, you know, one of the books was The Body Keeps Score. And the other one was adult children of emotionally immature parents. Um, and having to talk to your client about the role that, you know, someone so close to her, you know, her mother um, actually played in her life was, um, it was really heart-wrenching, right? For her to know that there are some people who cannot come along with you on your journey. And, you know, for her to have that conversation with people that she hadn't known that long, you know, took a lot of uh, groundwork for us to get to that point. Um, but we shared those materials with her. She ended up sharing them with other women um, at the prison to create sort of reading club. Um, and, you know, what was wow. sort of difficult was, you know, the fact that the trauma work is not just reading. Um, and then she's in an environment where she, you know, trauma is in your body. It can affect your reactions, automatic reactions to people. And so, you know, she just didn't have that much space to feel like she could cry, like she could move her body in certain ways. Um, and so we, we talked about that and brainstormed about that and gave her some mindfulness techniques. Um, and so it was really, you know, her doing a lot of hard work and us acknowledging, you know, that work. Um, you know, one, one instance where we sort of were able to see, you know, the impact of automatic reactions and, and her coping mechanisms for trauma was when we finally got a hold of her counselor 
Um, you know, we reached out to Sanctuary. Sanctuary helped us, you know, call the facility and the counselor ended up coming to a session while I was with my client. And this is after my, you know, our client had not spoken to a counselor that, you know, really the entire time that she was uh, in prison and the counselor kind of walked in, you know, without, you know, sort of any apology and, you know, it's very um, sort of, you know, walked in and started asking questions and my client, you know, got automatically defensive and was kind of like, where, where have you been? <laughs> you know, I haven't met with you. You know, no one prepared me for my first hearing and she was kind of charging, um, you know, ahead with her concerns and the counselor yelled at my client, um, got really defensive, sort of, you know, just, just went off on her. And, you know, my, I was able to stay really calm, although I was pissed. <laughs> you know, and to be able to de-escalate the situation and explain to the counselor, you know, where my client was coming from, you know, you know, certain things that were sort of outside of everyone's control that we, that, you know, we understand the sort of prison system is impacting, you know, the counselor as well. And we, I ended up getting her to open up to find out that she had experienced trauma and had recently lost her father. And, you know, that's why she was not available and no one had taken on her cases. And so we just gave her space to share her story um, and talked about resources that the counselor might need. And then by the end of that, you know, she really opened up and was ready to receive, you know, all the things that we had been doing with our client. I was able to explain the trauma work the reentry plan and sort of walk her through some of everything that would be in our submission. And, you know, she explained to us that literally the next day she was uh, planning to submit um, our client's compass score, which would have been her assessment of our client's ability to um, reenter re -enter the community. Um, and so it was really uh, evident of the failures of the system that that, you know, could have happened without this meeting, but we were really happy that we had that conversation with her. And then, you know, another benefit of the interaction was that I was able to really talk to my client about, you know, what happened, right? Because I think a lot of times if, you know, you're experiencing trauma and you react, you don't necessarily always get the chance to back up and think about Right. At one point, the counselor said, if you have that attitude, you're going to, you know, you're not going to get parole again. Right. She was very forceful with her. And it was a good thing that I was there so that we can unpack that because we, we didn't wouldn't want her to have that sort of defensive reaction with the parole board. Right. And we were able to like really unpack. OK, well, you see what happened when we were able to deescalate. De you can kind of try to get what you need and think about, you know, a couple of steps ahead away from the situation. Um, and so, you know, we had that experience and continue to work with her, you know, on her trauma work and work with her on her submission. And we just saw a tremendous amount of, of, of growth and, and ability to sort of apply coping skills, you know, in the remaining of our, our sessions before her parole hearing um, to the point where, you know, we got a really, uh, you know, disturbing news at one visit that, you know, our client, you know, she was just walking with a friend and another inmate just squarely punched her directly in the face. And, and our client just walked away. She did not react because she just knows in the prison environment, you know, she would get in as much trouble as the person who um, attacked her. And, you know, she was able to really think about her future goals and to sort of really, you know, not be brought down to, you know, the level of, you know, physically retaliating against someone. Um, and thankfully, eventually, we were able to sort of get the message of cross in terms of what happened to her. But, you know, she started to see that, you know, I really am becoming a new person. I'm, I'm drawing on parts of me that I didn't before and feeling that, you know, I know I'll be a success that she'll be able to draw boundaries, you know, with people when she when she leaves the prison. And so it was just amazing for us to be on that journey with her, um, to sort of be alongside with her, to see all the administrative hurdles, to see the impact of the conditions that she faced um, and to help her really try to reframe her story about herself and, and help her craft a new one. 
Well, thank you so much, Nefertini. And I know that you have also come back for, for more um, and you're, you're hoping to work on more cases with us, with survivors. Um, and I appreciate that so much. And I know one of the things that made your representation so successful with a, uh, with a client who was um, reticent to trust anyone, uh, no less lawyers, was that you went actually to the prison and you spent so much time with her in person and in the age of COVID, not just on the phone, but, but actually uh, meeting with her in person and get her to open up. And, and she eventually did. And like you said, she was a new person at the end. So we appreciate the work you did so much and, and looking forward to working with you again. Um, another case that we uh, had recently with tremendous success in a parole case um, was with some Simpson Thatcher lawyers, Jerry and Shanice. Um, Shanice, can you can you tell us a little bit about that case and and who your client was and and how she ended up in that position where you were working with her? Yes, yeah, sure. Um, uh, our client was uh, sentenced to six to twelve years in prison for participating in a scheme to defraud the elderly, and she was convicted on larceny counts as well as a hate crime against the elderly, um, and specifically she signed and cashed illegitimate checks. Um, and we're happy to be here today to say that she was granted parole and is scheduled to go home in March, as well as um, similar to Bintha and Nefertiti's client. Um, our client, she, she came from a loving family, a supportive home, and um, you know, she didn't come from a lower socioeconomic background, uh, but her life did take an unfortunate turn when she became involved with uh, her abusive boyfriend, right? When she graduated from high school, she was only 18 years old and, he, oh, 18 years old, and he was eight years older than her. Um, due to this relationship, she became estranged from her family and her parents and, uh, you know, very quickly moved in with him and his family. Their relationship grew tumultuous after she became pregnant with their first child. Um, during this time, she couldn't turn to her family. He was the only person really um, that she thought would be able to protect her. So because of that, he was very controlling. She had to, you know, listen to everything that he said, wear the type of clothing that he wanted her to wear. Um, and the control just continued to grow. Um, she injured physical abuse while she was pregnant. Um, and he just continued to use fear and threats to control her essentially for nine years. And due to all of this, it's how she became involved in these um, schemes to defraud the elderly. Um, and, you know, in this instant case, she committed the offense while she was six months pregnant. So she was six months pregnant. He told her she had to cash the check. Um, later on, when she was arrested, she had just given birth to her, her third child, a newborn son, and that's who she had to leave behind. Um, so, you know, when she was incarcerated, she was really just at her lowest of lows, and it was a very, very difficult time for her, but those six years that she spent incarcerated really allowed her to change her life and find herself. This was the first time in her adult life that she had, you know, spent this long of a period of time away from her abuser. She was able to um, reconnect with her family. She was able to really take advantage of the programs that uh, the prison offered, especially, you know, um, to gain uh, more skills and try to reconnect with her children, being that they were all so young and just positive um, programming and trauma relief. 
Uh, so, so when Simpson got involved in the case, our client was very, very eager. And I think that she, you know, did trust us from the beginning and was very enthusiastic to, you know, let us know that she had already gotten a lot of um, letters of support from her family, from her friends. And, you know, she just was very, very focused on all she had accomplished. I think the biggest challenge was really allowing her to be comfortable with her story. She focused mainly, you know, on the progress that she had made, which was amazing, but she often minimized the trauma that she had to deal with. She minimized, you know, how she really got there and her involvement. And she was defensive um, because that was a time in her past that she never wants to go back to or never really wanted to think about. And so, you know, as as Binta said, just kind of going and visiting her in the in-person info meetings and allowing her to cry with us and allowing her to feel comfortable, um, you know, being able to say what she did and that she does regret it without feeling as if, you know, she never deserves to get out or never deserves to see her children again. Just just that guilt um, and allowing her to identify it, but recognize how far she has come. Um, And, you know, the process also had interesting bumps in the road. And um, as I said, she was very excited to get all the materials that she needed. And I recall one visit, she mentioned that in an attempt to get a letter of support from a correction officer, um, you know, she, she went down and asked if they'd mind writing a letter on her behalf. And the officer Uh, was busy and said, could you just wait in this office? I'm coming back. Unfortunately, a more senior officer came in and asked her why was she in the office? It wasn't um, somewhere that inmates were usually allowed to enter. Um, And she tried to explain that, but um, she was immediately like told to go to leave. Um, And later that day, she found out that she was fired from the messenger job that she had, which was to to deliver mail. Um, And it was a privilege. And, you know, she was extremely angry and hurt. But instead of sort of just accepting that result and that consequence, she actually wrote a letter to, you know, the senior officer Um, explaining why she was there, explaining what she was trying to do, explaining that she had never had a disciplinary infraction, never had a ticket, and that she deserved to have her job back, and she got it back. And so, you know, hearing her advocate for herself um, and, you know, being able to be her own hero was a huge, um, just like very, very rewarding for us and being able to build that relationship and and have her feel comfortable, you know, kind of telling her, telling us what she's currently dealing with. Um, And and so that was very rewarding for us. I think that being able to build a connection with her as well as her family and the amazing team, Simpson team that we had, consisted of me, Jerry Fang, and Mark Stein really allowed us to um, represent our client successfully. Thanks, Janice. And, and you, you touched on one of the things that I find so rewarding about this work, which is, you know, no matter what the outcome of a case, you had a great outcome, you got parole granted, but just seeing the, the change in survivors from having advocates who listen to them, who believe them, who are on the outside and and who are going to be arguing for them and representing them. I find, you know, one of the most satisfying looking at a client, looking at a survivor from the beginning of a representation to the end and just seeing how much they've changed. And like you said, you know, being able to be their own hero, a a much stronger person because of the the work we do. Um, Jerry, I know you worked on that same case. 
What, what did you find were some of the, the biggest challenges and um, what are the most important things that you did in that representation to be successful? Yeah, so I, I think, um, you know, as Shanice mentioned, I think uh, collaboration with the client um, in terms of just regular practice and preparation and communication and building trust um, with her and her friends and family was, was super, super key. Um, just having a good working relationship. It, it wasn't as if we only went there once or twice. It was something where we were always on the phone with her, always um, going uh, uh, up to the correctional facility to, to visit her. Um, I'll also add just a, a couple other quick observations. I think, um, you know, uh, another key, I think that really helped out was just not being afraid to really rely on um, the wealth of experience of other initiative members. Um, I, I know for another case that we had together, we, um, whenever we had any questions about navigating the parole process or any questions about strategy or substance, we would um, reach out to folks and folks were very um, willing and eager to, to help out and were very, very, um, all of these successes were really sort of standing on the shoulders of um, so many of those who came before us. Um, and I think this really sort of goes to the spirit of the initiative as, um, as others have mentioned. Um, and I, I think another, uh, another thing was, um, as Vinta and Nefertiti were saying, um, was sort of building a, an understanding and collaborative relationship with um, the corrections personnel. Um, I, I think we had often uh, we were in regular communication with um, our client's counselor as well as the, the supervising counselor. And it was really just another chance to be an advocate um, for the client. And it, it really wasn't something that we expected, but was something that we welcomed as potentially being helpful on the margins in terms of the correctional facility being more lenient and relaxing certain rules or regulations or back channeling us and bypassing some of the red tape. Um, I think it's also just helpful from an institutional perspective as well. Um, since a lot of us are repeat players, um, I think it does help to, to sort of be seen as uh, credible and collaborative. And Jerry, I, I know you just touched on this, but you have like so many of the, the, peop, uh, the attorneys we work with, come back for, for more cases because of the um, you know, success you've had and, and, and what you've learned during the first one. Uh, you know, I hate to put you on the spot, but, but why, why do you keep coming back to us and asking for more work? And what, why do you wanna work with survivors? Sure, yeah, so I, I, I think there are, uh, there are a few reasons. I think, you know, sort of at the most service level, um, there is a lot of just really client-centered substantive experience. Um, in, in terms of advocacy and presentation skills and fact development and writing skills and interviewing skills and, and all of that. Um, when you're interviewing the client and advising the client and preparing the client for the interview um, and just really getting to know the client and the client's um, circle in the course of pulling together the submission. And um, so I think just from a litigator skill development perspective, it's been um, fantastic just to keep gaining um, experience in all of these different aspects of the case. Um, but I would say the second sort of more deeper reason is it really goes to the heart um, of why I, and I'm sure a lot of other people went to law school to begin with. Um, personally, I when I was in high school, um, I had partnered with an international human rights organization. Um, basically, the organization worked with local law enforcement to um, combat child sex trafficking and forced child labor. And I think it was just a very eye-opening experience, um, just seeing the injustice and the oppression of some of, you know, like society's really most vulnerable and marginalized people um, just made me really see law and policy and advocacy as a very powerful tool 
for bringing about justice. And so I think a lot of the work that um, we've done through the initiative has just been incredibly rewarding and meaningful just from a, a compassionate human level perspective. Thanks so much, Jerry. And, and we're very much looking forward to working with you and your colleagues again in the future. Sure. Um, another thing that we at the initiative have uh, worked on quite a bit are cases under the new New York statute, relatively new at this point, Domestic Violence Survivors Justice Act. It's a really revolutionary, unique statute that New York put into place. And uh, one of the leading practitioners through the initiative and outside the initiative uh, has been Dennis McInerney. So Dennis, I was hoping that you could tell us a little bit about what this statute is and, and how you got involved in working on uh, cases involving that statute. Sure, sure. So uh, the DVSJA was passed in New York in 2019, uh, and it provides the most forward-leaning sentencing relief for victims of domestic violence in the country. Um, and, and just uh, briefly in terms of my background with the DVSJA, it was in October of 2019, just a couple of months after the statute went into effect, uh, that Legal Aid had reached out to, to see if we at Davis Polk would partner with them on a potential case. I had never heard of the DVSJ, uh, it was brand new. Uh, our client uh, had been a 17 year old trafficking, sex trafficking victim, uh, who in addition to having been severely abused by her traffickers on every level, uh, had been forced by them to assist in their robberies of locksmiths. Uh, while her traffickers had not been prosecuted for these robberies, uh, she was. And uh, she went to trial, uh, she was convicted, and she was sentenced to nine years in prison. Uh, over the course of the next few months after uh, joining uh, David Crow at Legal Aid, who is the absolute master in these cases, uh, after we joined him um, and we learned at, at, at the feet of David about this new law and what the defense and pro bono communities were doing to try to find meritorious cases for potential DVSJ applications. Uh, Dara Scheinfeld, who's the head of uh, pro bono litigation at Davis Polk, uh, and I, you know, we were hooked and we decided uh, to go all in on these cases. Uh, and to qualify for a potential resentencing under the DVSJ, it's not very complicated. Uh, the client must have been a victim of substantial physical, sexual, or psychological abuse. And that abuse must have been a significant contributing factor to the crime of conviction. Uh, the final requirement is that the sentence uh, the client received, which must have been at least eight years or more for the client to be eligible for uh, potential resentencing, uh, it must be viewed as unduly harsh, taking into account all of the facts and circumstances, including what the client has done while incarcerated. Uh, so the challenge for the defense bar has been defined out of the 487 incarcerated women in New York State prisons who were serving sentences of at least eight years or more in prison, uh, those cases which would actually qualify for DVSJ applications. And thankfully, there's an incredible group of passionate and talented lawyers who have dedicated much of their lives over the last couple of years to doing just that, including Ross at Sanctuary, David at Legal Aid, and Kate Mogulescu uh, at Brooklyn Law School, just to name a few. So uh, with the benefit of of the leadership of these great lawyers, uh, we in the private sector pro bono bar have joined many of these cases and Davis Polk, we've been involved in about 15 of them. Well, Dennis, I, I know you've been involved in about 15. You've had about six or maybe more successful DVSGA applications at this point, meaning getting um, survivors out of prison who have served, who have sentences of at least eight years. Um, What's your approach in these cases? And, and maybe you could tell us a little bit about, I know the most recent one was particularly uh, significant and rewarding to you. Uh, maybe you could tell us a little about that. Sure. So just in terms of the typical approach in these cases, our perspective is to start with the presumption uh, that the prosecutor's only interest is in doing justice. Uh, so in these cases, just as in any uh, uh, other criminal case that I've been involved in as either a prosecutor or a defense lawyer, our hope is that both the defense and the prosecution can agree on most of the facts. And our job as defense attorneys is to help the prosecution in understanding what the facts are. 
So to do that, uh, we have to collect and present to the prosecutors all of the relevant evidence, including very often uh, expert psychological evaluations of our client. And the way we've often done this is we've actually sent to the prosecutors a draft of our DVSJ application and asked them to then engage in a dialogue with us in which we can have a back and forth with them about any questions or concerns they might have. And we'll also often have our clients submit to an interview with the prosecutors to help them understand you know, what our clients have been through. And as a result of that process, uh, while we will often be left with some degree of disagreement with respect to certain factual questions, our hope is that we can all agree that any areas of conflict uh, don't need to be resolved in order for the prosecutors to agree to support the DVSJ application because we've met the three elements of a DVSJ application. Now, speaking to the most recent uh, case that uh, you were asking about, Ross, uh, our most recent case uh, involved a woman who was just 17 uh, when she tried to break up with her uh, horribly abusive and sadistic boyfriend who was several years older than her and who she had been dating for a couple of years. Uh, in response, that day, uh, when she uh, tried to break up with him, he convinced her that they should go back to her apartment where she lived with her parents and her brother so that they could get his things and apologize to her father for uh, having gotten into a fight with him earlier that day. Once in the apartment, rather than apologizing to her father, he instead brutally strangled him to death. And he then did the exact same thing to her mother, all in her presence. Over the next two weeks, he then forced her to assist him in disposing of her parents' bodies, repeatedly raped her, and threatened to kill her grandmother, her aunt, and her brother if she didn't tell the police in the event that they ever were to uh, approach them, if she didn't tell them that she had participated in murdering her parents and that they had done so because her parents had been using her. Terrified, terrified, she did everything that he had instructed her to do, and they were both ultimately given sentences of 30 years to life. Now, in terms of some of the challenges we faced in this case, uh, there were many, including that by the time that uh, we at Davis Polk and the remarkable Zoe Root at the Center for Appellate Litigation, who's co-counsel, uh, who we were co-counsel with on, on this case, uh, by the time we all had gotten involved in this case, our client had already been in prison for a couple of decades. And rather, uh, and, and gathering um, and understanding the facts concerning events that happened over 20 years ago was extremely challenging. Uh, we were also in a position of having to try to persuade, among others, the original prosecutor from 20 years ago, who, like the vast majority of prosecutors, had never had much experience dealing with survivors of domestic violence. And we had to try to persuade everybody to take a fresh look at a case that had understandably seemed to them to be an open and shut case at the time. Uh, and one of the biggest challenges for us was to be able to collect and present to the team of prosecutors who were considering our application sufficient corroboration to persuade them of the abuse that our client had suffered. Uh, and we had to do all of this during a pandemic when it was extremely challenging to, to meet with or even to speak on the phone with our client. So very briefly, among the things that we did to respond to these challenges included, we had an expert psychologist spend dozens of hours with our client and then submit a 30 page report detailing the abuse and its impact on our client. Uh, we spoke with many potential fact witnesses and ultimately submitted to the prosecutors uh, affidavits from several of them uh, to the abuse that they had witnessed. Uh, we put together a 20 minute video of our client and her many supporters so that we could try to bring to life for the team of prosecutors who were trying to consider our application and who have so many cases and, and most often just learn about the defendants that they are prosecuting through written submissions and, and attorney discussions. We were hoping to bring to life for them who our client was and what she had been through. And we had our clients sit down with the prosecutors for a seven hour interview as re-traumatizing as that was and, and so often is in these cases so that they could hear directly from her what she had experienced. Finally, we provided them with a 45-page detailed single-space submission that laid out in extreme detail 
the evidence that corroborated the abuse that she had suffered. As a result, the prosecutors ultimately agreed to join us in our application. Uh, the judge granted the motion and resentenced our client just before Thanksgiving, which resulted in her immediate release without any post-release supervision after having served 21 years. Finally, I think it might be helpful to give you just some insight into the experience for our client in terms of this, this entire process with the DVSJA. At her resentencing, among other things, she said, and I'm quoting now, as a survivor of domestic violence, I want to thank the district attorney's office for acknowledging what I went through. Your acknowledgement that I am a survivor makes me feel less ashamed to have a conversation about my experiences. Thanks to you, I think I will feel less isolated in my re-entry. Now I know how to seek out help the right way." End quote. So now just 38 years old, our client graduated magna cum laude from college while in prison and was the graduation day speaker as just an incredibly bright future. Dennis, that, that's, I mean, the case is so inspiring. It makes me want to take on more of these cases and that's my full-time job. Um, I know Rich touched on this at the beginning, but I have one more quick question for you. Um, what's it like greeting your client when she gets out of prison? I know that you and, and your whole team or as much of your team as you could went up and actually picked her up and, and, and spent time with her after in person. What, what was that like? Well, I mean, you know, words can't possibly uh, do justice. Uh, to what that was like. I mean, being with the others on the team, Zoe, uh, Dara, uh, uh, some of the associates, Elena, Emma from Davis Polk, uh, out of the many others that wanted to be there, but but uh, were away by that time because it was the Thanksgiving week. You know, being there to greet our client as she walked out of prison on the Tuesday before Thanksgiving, and then taking her to a celebratory lunch at a local restaurant with several others in her support group, I mean, without question, that was the most satisfying day of my 36 year legal career, 37 year legal career, as, as I'm sure it was for everybody else on the team. So it's just, you, you, it doesn't get any better than that. Wow, that's, that's amazing. Um, one last topic that I wanted to touch on before, before we end, uh, another chunk of work that the initiative does and, and that we're trying to get more involved in is uh, our advocacy efforts, actually trying to change the system positively, not just working on um, individual cases. And, and one effort that, that Dennis, you and, and Rich and I are all working on together um, is advocating for reform of the women's prison system in, in, in New York State, which is really broken. Um, you know, Rich, you, you were a driving force behind um, this advocacy work. Um, what made you focus on this issue and, and, and what have you been, what are you hoping to achieve through it? Well, like so many other things, Ross, uh, I think what made us focus on it was what we were hearing from our clients uh, about the abominable conditions in the women's prisons. <clears throat> Failure to meet such basic needs as hot water, clean water, heat, access to toilet paper, incidents of prison staff using violence against incarcerated women, sexual uh, abuse, verbal abuse, lack of privacy. And, and then on top of it, lack of access to, to mental health care, but also not only inadequate programming, but the fact that there had been in recent years a loss of important programming for victims of gender violence who were incorporated that had once existed particularly at the Bedford uh, prison, one of three women's prisons in, the, in New York State, when, it, when Elaine Lord, one of our original initiative members, uh, was the superintendent at uh, Bedford. Uh, so we learned from our clients and we learned from the Correctional Association of New York, which has the uh, license to go in and interview incarcerated uh, people in all of the prisons in New York and conduct surveys. And <clears throat> so then we were, we were well aware of the deficiencies, but then the question arose as to, well, why women's prisons? Because 
the conditions at all the prisons in the state uh, are, are deficient. But consistent with what we've been talking about today, many indeed an overwhelming majority of the people who are incarcerated in women's prisons are themselves victims of gender violence who are suffering from serious trauma. <laughs> the percentage is something like something north of 70%. And as a result, their needs for programming and their vulnerability to the failings of the system uh, are, are particularly great. And the consequences of the failings of the system on this population is, <clears throat> are even more damaging. Uh, and so we embarked on this project, teaming up actually with the Correctional Association. And the, uh, <clears throat> and the goal is to engage with uh, policymakers, decision makers, in order to bring about change uh, with respect to the conditions in the prisons, in the women's prisons, and the services that are provided to incarcerated victims, to incarcerated women. And so it's early days, but um, we're off to a, a very promising start, and I'm optimistic. Thanks, Rich. And I know one of the things that um, <clears throat> we're already starting to work on is expanding uh, another area, which is our post-release assistance and support for, for clients who are getting out after uh, you know, long prison sentences. And I think by the next time we have one of these, we'll be able to all discuss that with, um, with everyone else. But I think that's so important because um, you know, we try to provide holistic care. That's what you and Dorchin uh, envision. So uh, certainly, you know, helping survivors even after they're released on our cases is, uh, is gonna be so important to us. I know we only have a couple of minutes left, so um, I wanted to take a couple of the questions that we um, received on the chat and um, give a little bit of additional information. So someone asked, you know, how many clients do we have at any one time? Um, we have about 20 clients right now. Um, what I try to do is we're not turning people away. We have a very small staff, but clients who come to us, survivors who come to us, um, who, who uh, need assistance, whether with their legal case, with their conditions inside the prisons, um, we're working to help everyone we can. Um, we're hoping to add more staff in the future, uh, but largely it's, it's myself, it's a volunteer who's, who's so fantastic named Isabel Demange. Um, and we have uh, externs from Columbia Law School, LLM students who have been very helpful. And our pro bono community is, is the biggest resource we have. And our pro bono partners add so much to these cases and make all of this possible. Um, you know, another question that I didn't get in the chat, but I'm going to ask is, you know, how can, how can you guys help? How can you get involved? Um, reach out to me, um, my email address and, and phone number in the chat. It's rkramer at sffny.org. My phone number is 646-263-8009. I love talking about these cases. I'd love for more people to get involved um, with them. And honestly, um, you know, our, our funding helps uh, us provide these services. So if anyone is able to, to donate anything to, to our initiative, it's so helpful. It goes directly to our ability to represent survivors and, and provide this kind of assistance both you know, before they are involved in the criminal justice system during and, and hopefully even after. Um, are there any other questions that I could take at this point while we have another five minutes left? I see one, is there a way for retired and non-affiliated lawyers to get involved? Yes, absolutely. In the initiative, we have quite a number of retired attorneys, retired judges, um, advocates who are no longer doing that full-time. Um, who add tremendous insight, experience, um, energy to what we're doing. So those are, those are terrific resources. If anyone wants to reach out, I, I would love to work with you and we can find real meaningful ways for, for people to get involved. Um, I'm just gonna check the chat. Um, I think that, that those are all the questions that I have for right now. Thank you all so much for attending. Thanks to all the panelists for being here. 
everyone's doing, you know, remarkable work from Rich and Dorchin and Dennis really, to, you know, starting this initiative, getting it off the ground before I even join and uh, our panelists for, for doing this kind of work and directly impacting survivors' lives. And I hope to have the chance to uh, work with more of you in the future.